the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 26, and we had a few weeks where we weren't dealing with the Proverbs, but we come back to it this evening. Proverbs chapter 26, and we're going to begin reading in verse 17 here in just a moment. Proverbs chapter 26, verse number 17. We've been looking at practical uh, advice, practical principles, foundational principles from the book of Proverbs uh, concerning life and different areas of our life. And they're much wisdom, of course. They're often uh, very pithy, we may say blunt statements that the Bible gives us uh, here uh, in the book of Proverbs that are meant for our learning, our admonition, our, admonition, our help. And uh, we come to another portion here this evening. And this evening we're going to deal with, uh, Lord willing, tonight and then again next Wednesday evening. We're going to deal with the subject of our tongue. Our tongue. And I've titled this message, and it'll be a part one of two parts, Monitoring Your Mouth. Monitoring Your Mouth. Have you ever felt like you need a monitor for your mouth, you know, uh, to keep track of what comes out and make sure that what shouldn't come out doesn't come out? Uh, that's what we're going to deal with for the next couple of weeks. Proverbs chapter 26, act, this passage from verse 17 down to the end, and we're going to read the entire section here, we'll make some comments as we go along. Uh, but this section deals primarily with the tongue, the mouth. Uh, and we want to look at what uh, the writer has to instruct us about concerning our speech. Proverbs chapter 26, look at verse number uh, 17. By the way, the, the, the tongue, the mouth is a major theme throughout the book of Proverbs. Look, look what he says. Let's, let's just begin verse number 17 here. He said, He that passeth by... And meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. And there it is, one of those striking, blunt, pointed statements that we have right as we begin uh, uh, this passage here, this part of the passage in Proverbs chapter 26. What's he talking about? He says, if you're passing by, uh, and there are people who are involved in strife in some way, and we... <laughs> It's hard not to have that happen, right? We live in a world that's full of strife all over the place. Uh, there's, sadly, there's strife in homes. There's strife in the workplace. Uh, strife creeps into the church. But the Bible says here, if there's, if there's strife that's going on and you pass by and you get involved in it, you try to interject and you, you put your two cents in and you meddle with it, it says what? You're like a man that takes the dog by the ears. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that or not. By the way, that's not a very smart move. To take a dog by the ears. And, you know, it's not just talking about, oh, petting the ears, and aren't, isn't that a nice ear, and that type of thing. No, it's talking about taking it and grabbing, pulling the ears, you know. And uh, how many of you own a dog? How many of you own a dog in here? Several of you own a dog. Yeah. And uh, how many of you own a, you, it's a fairly good-sized dog. Fairly good size. Yeah. And would you like, would you do that? Probably not, right? Even though the dog knows you. Uh, uh, probably wouldn't just take it and grab it and pull it by the ears. Why? Very likely, as you pull that dog, what's that dog going to do? That dog's going to naturally react. Now, my children, uh, they love to get in the, the face of our dog. And uh, I always tell them, don't get in the dog's face because, uh, uh, you know, not a very clean place to be. Uh, in the dog's face, but they, they like to do that type of thing. But I guarantee if you got right down there in the dog's face and you pull the dog's ears, what's the dog on, in all likelihood going to do? Even if it's a docile dog, in all likelihood he might take a hunk, right? I heard a story j just the other day about a, a fellow who did that, a preacher of all people, and uh, started messing with the dog, and the dog got right down the dog's face, and the dog actually bit the end of his nose off. He went back and grabbed, I know this, everybody has eaten, right? He went back in and grabbed the dog's, the, the, uh, out of the dog's mouth, that piece of his nose, took it back and they actually put it back on. Actually reattached uh, uh, his nose there. Uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is this, uh, uh, you, he says, if you pass by and you meddle in strife, you're like that kind of person. Not a very wise person to do that sort of thing. Look at verse number 18. Let's continue on. I, I think that's all the stomach-turning things we'll talk about tonight. Verse number 18. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, 
so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? Say, so preacher, what's, what's he talking about there? And he's talking about the man that comes in there, uh, the madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death. And, and then he says, he comes around and he says, Well, I was just, have you ever had somebody say things to you? Cutting things, uh, sharp things. And they then turned around and said, Oh, I was just joking. And remember this, in every jest there's a measure of truth. In every jest there's a measure of truth. And what he's, what's he saying? He's saying, watch how far you take your joking. Watch how far you take that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not true, right? Not true at all. Well, let's go on. Look at verse number 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. That's easy to understand. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. You know, a lot of troubles in our life would die out if we would just guard our tongues. Look at verse 21. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, it fuels it, right? So is a contentious man to what? To kindle strife. In other words, a man who spreads strife, he's trying to... To get others, you've heard the expression, misery loves company, loves company, strife loves company too. Because the person who has a lot of strife, and, 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 and he wants to get as many people, or she wants to get as many people ignited by that strife as possible. Matter of fact, they'll pull in people that are totally unaffected by the strife that they're dealing with, uh, or that they're trying to stir up just to stir up more. Look what the Bible says here in verse number 22. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down in the innermost parts of the belly. What's he saying? He's saying those, those wounds, they hurt deeply. Those words, they wound and they hurt deeply. Look at verse number 23. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver draws. In other words, a man with a wicked tongue... Sometimes he can look good. He can feign things on the outside. He can, he can really make everything look good on the outside. But on the inside, he's worthless. He's vain. He's empty. Look at verse number 24. He that hateth dissembleth. That word dissembleth means betrays. He that hateth, in other words, betrays with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. How does a man betray himself? He betrays himself most often by his mouth, his tongues, what he says. I look at verse 25 to the end. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth the stone it will return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Well, we have a detailed account of the dangers of the tongue, whether it be a flattering tongue, whether it be a wicked tongue, whether it be a lying tongue, whatever the case may be, a betraying tongue, a detailed account right here in this passage. In other words, the writer is trying to point out that the tongue, our mouth, is very central to our Christian life, either the success of our Christian life or the failure of our Christian life. It's gauged most often by our speech, by our tongue. And remember what the Lord Jesus said, uh, uh, that out of the abundance of the what? Heart, the mouth speaketh. Uh, so it's just a little, uh, it's just a, 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 a little picture, if you will, of what's going on in our heart, what we say, the speech that we use. So if we're going to be successful as a believer, if we're going to do the will of God, which is what being successful as a believer is, then we're going to have to guard, we're going to have to keep, we're going to have to watch out for our tongue, monitor, as I said the title, monitor our mouth. Now that's easier said than done. That's easier said than done. 
But as we look in the book of Proverbs, there are certain parameters, and we're going to look at some of them this week and some next week, certain parameters for our mouth, certain parameters for our speech and for our tongue. And if we'll uh, be habitual at keeping and following and obeying these parameters, uh, our speech can become more productive. It, it can be a blessing instead of a burden. It, it can be positive uh, instead of negative. So some things we're going to look at. Now, we need to get this down first and foremost. None of us are perfect with our tongues. Do you know who probably has the most uh, hard time with their tongue? The guy you're looking at, the preacher. You know why? Because I'm constantly running my mouth. It just goes with the territory of being a preacher, right? I'm constantly using my tongue. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, James chapter 3, verse number 1, My brethren, be not many masters. He's warning against those who, who, who all, they, they, they want to ascribe to greatness and, and, and be teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Why is that? For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and notice what he said at the end of verse 2, and able also to bridle the whole body. And you go on, and what does he deal with in James chapter 3? He deals with the tongue, right? He deals with the tongue. Now, he said there in that verse, he said that there is no one, essentially, it's implied, there's no one who is perfect, perfect. Uh, you know what? If we develop the right habits of speech, of being able to follow the Scriptures and control our tongue, we can minimize the problems that come from our speech and our tongue and our mouth. Now some things we want to deal with tonight. Just a couple quick things. First of all, being able to control our tongue is an indication of something. It's an indication of something that we find over and over again emphasized in the book of Proverbs. And it's one word. It's the word wisdom. Wisdom. So to be able to control our tongue, that can only be done through the help of the Spirit of God, shows wisdom, godly wisdom. Now look with me back in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 15, and maybe you never left there, but look in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 2. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 2. Notice what the Bible says. The tongue of the wise useth the knowledge of right, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Now that's an important verse. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Now, I want you to notice, as often you see in the book of Proverbs, you see, here's a big, here's a big term, and it stands for contrast, or it stands for two different uh, ways that are shown. It's the word dictonomy. And so you have two different ways that are contrasted. You have the way of uh, uh, the righteous man, the right way, and then on the opposite side of that, you have the man who is foolish or the man who is wicked. And that's what you have right here in verse 2 of Proverbs chapter 15. Two ways are contrasted. And notice again, the tongue of the wise, but then you have the mouth of the fools. These two ways. Now, here's something very interesting. Just because we know something, it is not an invitation to speak freely. Did you know that? Just because you receive knowledge about something is not an invitation just to speak about it. It really isn't. You know that knowing things often requires silence. It often requires silence. Now, there are some people who when, as soon as they receive knowledge about something, they think that immediately they must tell everybody. But what does the Bible say right here? Watch out for that type of person. Why? Because the foolish does what? Notice what the Bible says at the end of verse 2. The mouth of the foolish does what? It pours out foolishness. No wisdom, no discernment, just, just, just letting it all out. Just blabbing it all out. But a wise individual, what do they do? They take uh, uh, what has been received, the knowledge they've been given... And in their speech, they use 
use it with that knowledge, that understanding, to obtain what? A positive result, a desirable result. So sometimes one doesn't tell everything he knows because he has to be uh, understanding about the knowledge that's been received. He has to have some discernment about that knowledge that he's received. Do you know that in, in this position uh, uh, that I hold and in a leadership position, whether it's the pastor or other leadership positions, uh, that oftentimes it requires more silence than speaking? It requires more silence and not to tell everything that everybody knows about every situation. I, I, I remember one fellow, and he thought he had to be transparent about every last little detail of his life, uh, uh, and, and he just wanted to tell every last little thing, uh, and he began to be open publicly about certain things in his thought life, and I had to go to him and tell him, he was in another place, I had to go to him and tell him, and said, look, look, that's something that's a personal matter, a private matter between you and God you need to deal with. You have to tell everybody about it. In fact, you shouldn't tell everybody about it. Why? Because it shows you don't have much wisdom to tell everybody about it. Yeah. Do you know that if I told everything I knew about every situation, I wouldn't be doing what the Bible says right here. I wouldn't be using knowledge or right. Why? Because there's a certain amount of confidence that's been placed in me. And by the way, I'm not the only person that's that way. There are other people like that. And even in your home, you know there's certain confidence placed with you. And you don't tell everything. Why? It's your responsibility to keep things confident, in other words. Now, foolish people, typically, foolish people, say whatever they know, whatever they conjecture about, at surmise, suppose, whatever they feel, or whatever they think, and oftentimes, you know what that does? That loose lips, that constant speaking, it betrays any trust that you have in them. Uh, I've heard people say, well, I'll tell you one thing, if I'm thinking it, I'm just going to tell it. Well, watch out, brother. Watch out. Yeah, somebody said, peace of my mind. You know, I've got to be careful. I don't want to give away too many pieces. You know, I want to hang on to those pieces as much as possible. Proverbs chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 32. The lips of the righteous, now this is interesting, read this now, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. What kind of person knows what is acceptable? The righteous person. But the mouth of the wicked speaketh forwardness. In other words, what's he saying? If you have a righteous heart, you're going to have righteous lips. It's going to be right coming out of your mouth. Remember, the core of righteousness is this. The core of righteousness is meeting your obligation. Being right, obviously, first and foremost with God. In other words, you've got to ask yourself, am I obligated to speak or am I obligated to be quiet? Which is it? Do you know, if you're righteous, you're going to have direction from the Spirit of God who indwells you about whether to speak or whether to be silent. What to say or what not to say. And by the way, if it's best, if it's best not to speak, it is best to remain silent. It is best to remain silent. Now notice what he said there again. Look at verse 32. The mouth, here it is. Here, remember, you got these two contrasts. Lips of the righteous, mouth of the wicked. What does the mouth of the wicked do at the end of the verse? It speaketh what? What's that word? Frowardness, right? What does froward mean? Froward means the same thing that perversity means. They're, they're uh, synonymous. Do you know what that word is? It means this. It means twisted. Twisted. So the mouth of fools, the wicked, speaketh what? Frowardness, perversity, things that are twisted. A wicked heart, in other words, pours forth in twisted or forward speech. Mark this down. Sin always betrays itself. If you listen closely, you're going to be able to hear it. You're going to be able to detect it. Righteous lips 
the opposite of that, the contrast of that. They have discretion, they have discernment, they have direction from the Spirit of God. They know what's acceptable. Righteous lips comes from a righteous heart. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Verse number 28. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 28. A lot of help here. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. In other words, the righteous man careful in his speech, conservative in his speech. The wicked man, man, is just pouring out like a sieve, you know. Just, just rolling out. No thought. Just pouring out. Quick to answer. Uh, uh, uh. Quick to weigh in. All those types of things. You know, never be quick to answer in difficult or weighty decisions. Difficult or weighty questions. From time to time, by the way, I don't want to discourage anybody from asking me questions. That's fine. But from time to time, you may ask me a question, and I may not give you an immediate answer. And there's a reason I don't give you an immediate answer. I don't want to be quick to answer difficult or weighty questions. Why? A righteous man understands his responsibility to search the Scriptures, to know the Scriptures, to answer correctly, so he takes the time to think matters through. Where a wicked man, he, he just takes right off the, uh, 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 off the top, you know. He just takes a stab in the dark. My mother used to say this. A lot of wisdom. She used to say this. You can learn a lot by listening. You can learn a lot by wisdom, by listening. Now, if matter of fact, this this, this uh, we sat uh, we sat with them. I went to I went to church with my parents on Sunday. Went to the Valley Baptist Church there, and and uh, we got to eat some meals together on Saturday evening and Sunday. And and uh, my dad he got to talking right above where my grandparents lived. There's a little store, and my great grandparents used to run that store. My great grandfather was known as a man of few words. He didn't say much. And uh, he'd come in in the mornings. My father helped him, worked there with him for a little while. And he'd come in the mornings and he would say hi to my dad and then he wouldn't say anything more. It wasn't because he was mad at him. We wouldn't say anything more the rest of the day. Just a man of few words. My grandmother's the same way and my dad said my mother's the same way. <laughs> few words. But you know something constantly they were doing? Listening. Listening. You would be surprised if you could see how many people hang on and heed what you say. You'd be surprised. You're a preacher, I don't have any influence that way. You can forget that. Nobody listens to me. Wrong. People listen to you. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in not just trying to answer off the cuff about some questions, instead taking time to think it through with the counsel of the Word of God. Matter of fact, don't let anyone push you into answering difficult questions to get a quick answer. Now, remember this, wicked men feel uh, no obligation to search the truth, to answer correctly. They just want to answer and get on. And, and, and remember this, they have some preconceived idea, some preconceived agenda about what they want it to be. The answer they want it to be. But a wise man, what does the Bible say? What a wise man does there. He studieth, verse 28, he studieth to answer. Now, let me give you another thought. When to say nothing at all. Or, if you want to put it simply, when to be quiet. When to be quiet. Look in Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 12. This is what the Bible says. He that is void, that means empty, of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Here, here's some very helpful counsel. I've received it. I'm passing along to you. Many of you have probably heard it and already know about it. Choose your battles wisely. Choose your battles wisely. Um, someone I know has said this. They said, pick which hill you're going to die on. Choose your battles wisely. 
Can you live with some irritation for the sake of peace? Can you live with some irritation for the sake of peace? You know what it's going to take? It's going to take something we all have to work at. Patience. Patience. I have to learn that I don't have to confront every offense that comes my way. And I shouldn't allow multiple offenses to build in my heart. By the way, be very, 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 very careful about what you let offend you. Why? Well, what did David write in Psalm 119, 165? Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. Be careful. You know, it's, it, it is very dangerous to get permanently at odds with other people, whether it's people in your home, whether it's people in the workplace, whether it's your neighbor that you live beside of or anyone else you have regular contact with. In other words, what should be uh, 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 on guard, think before you speak. Have you ever said anything and you wish, ooh, man, I wish I could grab that and pull that back. It's too late. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 11. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 11. Notice what it says here. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. In other words, refrain from revealing too much information at the height of an issue or a controversy. Have you ever, anyone ever said to you, TMI? What's that mean? Too much information. I don't want to hear about it. Well, don't tell me. Uh, be careful. Be careful about what you say when you're about ready to explode. Be careful what you say because in the heat of the moment you always say things that you wish you could take back. You wish that you wouldn't have said. In other words, use the knowledge that you have to fix problems after those passions have cooled down. Don't, don't, don't try to launch in at the heat of a controversy or at the heat of a problem or at the heat of some strife and, and, and blast off about something. Be careful. You're going to say things you wish you'd never said. Bible wisdom, the Holy Spirit of God, common sense, they should all act as a sieve that you run your words through. between, In other words, between your brain and what you think and your mouth and what you speak, there ought to be a sieve there. What is it? Bible counsel, Bible wisdom, the Spirit of God, and some good old common sense that God has given to all of us. God help us to allow that to be a sieve. The Bible says, if look, if you utter all your mind, what are you? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, verse 11, a fool uttereth all of his mind. Be careful. Uh, Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 28. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 28. Now notice here, even a fool, Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. A fool, when he doesn't say anything, he's counted a wise person. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. If you're not sure what to say, it's better you don't say anything. It's better just, just be quiet. Why? Because the Bible says silence is the best cover for foolishness. Just don't say anything. Think about this. Sometimes silence advances us, an individual, whoever it may be, man or woman, more than speaking does. If you just learn to listen, learn to be silent. There are times when you shouldn't say anything at all because you don't have any direction or any wisdom or any answer from God on the matter. Just be better to be silent. Now, quickly, a couple last thoughts. What are some good results of allowing the Spirit of God to control your tongue? Look in Proverbs 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, verse 23. Notice what the Bible says. 
Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to stay far away from troubles. Now, God sends trouble sometimes for our learning, for our help. Matter of fact, all the troubles we have, there's something God's trying to teach us. Something that He's trying to do in our lives. But, troubles of the soul reach deep, don't they? Troubles of the soul reach extremely deep. Controlled speech, controlled tongue, monitoring our mouth, I believe would prevent some of our most grievous problems that we deal with. Some of our most grievous troubles. Uh, it'll prevent those, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that situations. Has your speech even innocently caused problems? You said things, you didn't mean anything by it. I mean, you didn't mean anything uh, with any malcontent at all, but you said something just in a passing moment, and it caused a stir. You ever been in that situation? And you're kind of like, whoa, what happened? I, I didn't mean to do that. How can I do that? I can stay out of a lot of trouble if I allow the Spirit of God, if I'm open to guarding my speech, guarding my tongue. Remember this, words spoken cannot be retracted. They cannot be pulled back. They're indelibly etched in people's memory. Before you speak, always assess the risk of what you're going to say. Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. Remember, all this is easily said, but not easily practiced. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. And he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. In other words, a mouth that's out of control, boy, it can lead to some major problems. Major problems. Look at chapter 14, again, verse 3. Chapter 14, verse 3. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. In other words, wise lips have what? The Bible says they have a preserving effect. Speaking wisely, controlling our tongue. But foolish lips, here it is, contrasted, preserving. What's the opposite of preserving? Putrefying, right? Destruction. A fool's mouth is going to destroy he says, be careful, watch out. So, tonight what we've seen is, we've seen this contrast between the wise tongue and the foolish tongue. The wise mouth and the foolish mouth. In other words, the wise person, they weigh very carefully through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, through common sense that God's given them to, to use those two tools, they weigh very carefully what they say before they speak. But a wicked individual, a foolish individual, very careless... Their mouth is uh, 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 just, like a, just like an open faucet. It pours forth foolishness in every direction. Be careful. What do we call that type of person? You ever been around that type of person? You never know what's going to come out of their mouth. We call them a loose cannon, right? Watch out. Be careful of the loose cannon. And here's another thing. Boy, seek not to be characterized as a loose cannon. I don't want to be known as a loose cannon. What are they? They're unpredictable. I was hearing a preacher tell a story. He, he liked hunting with black powder rifles. And he was going out, and some of you guys that have one maybe know what I'm talking about. He was going out with that black powder rifle, and he put the cap on there, and he had the, he had the powder in the, in the gun, and he already had the, uh, he had the round in there to fire. And he pulled the trigger, and it hit the cap to hit the spark. But the second, boom, you know, firing the gun, the spark didn't hit the powder. But the spark was still, what, there. And so it might be 20 minutes, might be an hour later. But the spark might hit and boom. Right? You know what? That's the way it often is with our mouths, with loose cannons. Be careful. Why? They're unpredictable. And they're dangerous. You wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to take that gun and and you know set it down somewhere like that. Why? Might go off. Might go off. 
A wise man understands that. And a wise man realizes that. He, he's careful with his speech. He's not characterized as a loose cannon. He allows the Spirit of God to control his tongue. And may that be our testimony, that God would control our tongue. That we would have sound speech, one that cannot be condemned. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your words. Thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray you'd help this preacher. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to have controlled speech, controlled tongue. Help these dear people who are sitting here tonight. Lord Jesus, help us not to be characterized as a foolish person, one that utters all their mind, one that has no control over their tongue and what they say, one that causes great harm to homes and workplaces and communities and churches. Lord, control our mouths. May they be monitored by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Help each of us, we pray. Be with us now as we go to our separate ways. Give us safety to our homes. Bring us back again at the time appointed. Bless us as we go out tomorrow night. May we reach many homes and invite many young people to be here. And may you bless in a great amount. May you do the work that only you can do. Bless on the Lord's day as well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.